Today is an incredible, joyous, unforgettable day in FPV, and that is because Express LRS have released version 3.4. Now, 3.4 may not sound like a big or interesting number, but don't be fooled here. A lot has changed. Finally, there has been a complete overhaul of the binding process. All of my prayers have been answered, and you can now bind Express LRS pretty much any way you want to. There's also new features around Gemini and a lot of other little interesting changes as well. Now, what we're going to do today is take a quick look at the release notes, and then I want to concentrate on two specific things. We're going to talk about the binding, because that is the big one here, and then we're going to talk a bit about these new Gemini updates as well. Now, I'm not going to spend too long going over the notes, but we are going to cover the main topics. Now, as I've said, it is version 3.4. At the top, you have the important stuff, talking about what your arm and switch must be on, all of the usual stuff. Do make sure you do read this, because it is very, very important. You've then got info on the compatibility, and who should update from version 3.3. Now, it is worth me highlighting there are some specific bugs in this fixed that you should take note of, especially if you use PWM or you're in the LBT region. You should update to this firmware if you're one of those users. And again, take some time to read this. What is also great to see in here is that they say who should not update from 3.3, and that is no one. This update is for everyone, so there is no reason here for you to consider to not do it. Now, there are a host of new features in this. There's some big ones and there's some small ones, which I'm going to walk through now. The first is what they call Team Race. This allows you to bind multiple receivers to one transmitter at the same time. It's not a feature I've tested or tried. More info is there in the notes, but it is quite interesting. I have been able to sort of do weird stuff around that in the past inadvertently if you had the same binding phrase and if you had it turned off that it would connect to the first receiver and some quirks around that stuff. Whereas now this is a proper feature that they have added. The second thing that they've added is serial protocol for HOTT telemetry. This is quite a big one for heli and fixed wing users. Not something I know anything about myself, but that is in there. And there's more notes in there around that if you want to know about it. Then moving over to PWM. Now they have made some changes for these receivers. So they've now added D-Shot output for PWM receivers, configurable I2C pins, to changes to the PWM failsafe modes, as well as the web UI. I'm not going to go into that any further than that. All of the pull requests are listed there for this, and I will put a link to them in the description of this video if you're interested in seeing it. Now the first major change that I'm going to talk about today is called better binding experience. Now, this isn't actually one change. This is a whole host of changes. So for instance, there's a pull request that says allow all binding methods on receiver. So whereas in the past, there were a few binding methods, you could plug in three times, you could use the binding phrase, or you could do it via the Wi-Fi configurator, or you could do it a couple of other methods as well. But it was a little bit clunky. Now, though, in this pull request, they've added a whole host of new features. So, for instance, a brand new receiver that is upgraded to this firmware will automatically now boot into binding mode. You don't need to go into the web UI. If it's never been bound to a transmitter before, it'll just fire up in binding mode. You can then enable binding in the Lewis script on your transmitter, it will connect and it's ready to go. There's also a whole host of other changes around binding which we'll cover as we move through, but there's now the support for binding via the CRFS protocol, which means you can trigger binding directly from within Betaflight or from Edge TX as well. And they've now made a couple of changes to how the receiver behaves in the sense of it now remembers the last packet rate used. So rather than when the receiver connects to the transmitter, it has to negotiate on the rates. Now it will remember the last rate used that should help speed up connection. Now, well, there is a lot more written here and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. We're actually going to demonstrate some of this new binding feature on the bench. The next big change is what they're calling Gemini Crossband or Gemini X. Now, this is the dual band version of Gemini. If you don't know what Gemini is, I do have a full video on it on a review of this beta FPV transmitter. I actually go into quite a lot of technical detail on that around how Gemini works. We even take a look at it on the Spectrum Analyzer. If you're interested in seeing that, I will put a link to it in the description. But the very basics are Gemini transmits two packets at the same time, but it was on the same band. So it was on different channels, but both on 2.4 gigs. 
The big change now is Gemini X allows you to do it cross band. So one packet being transmitted on 2.4 gigs, one packet being transmitted on 900 megs. Now this is going to require new transmitters. It isn't going to work with these existing transmitters. There is new hardware coming for this. However, it does mean you're going to have a sort of a bit of the best of both worlds. There is though some things you need to be aware of and that is that you can't actually have separate packet rates between the options. Using Gemini X will reduce the packet rates available to you in say 2.4 gigs mode. They actually show this here on the release notes. So for instance, four new RF modes have been added. So now in 900 megs or 868, there is a new 250 hertz mode. They've increased the speed in the sub gigahertz band option. There's also a full 200 hertz mode been added for Mavlink users. This is going to improve the telemetry performance on that mode for people who were using it with the likes of Ardra Pilot. And then there's the two new modes, which are dual band X, 150 hertz and 100 hertz. They are the modes that are going to use the dual transmission 2.4 and 900 megs. What you can't have with this though is in dual mode, say the 2.4 gigs in D500 and then 150 in 900. You're going to be limited to X150 or X100 in both. Moving down, there is also a number of other things. There's Sentinel antenna tracker integration via wireless telemetry over ESP now, and there's new targets as well. And that's pretty much everything I'm going to cover in the notes. If you do though, flip down to the bottom, you have the bug fixes listed. Again, there's a lot here to see, and it's great to see the ExpressRS dev team continue to do a great job of improving the system. Now, the big thing for me here in this update is the new binding options, because whilst ExpressRS wasn't difficult to bind, it was clunky. And this was often made worse by the fact that some vendors would ship their receivers not in the state that they should be, i.e. receivers from vendors should have come in an unbound state ready to bind, making people's life easier. But that always wasn't the case. And then you either had to do it via the web UI. If you want to do it via Wi-Fi, you could do it via the binding phrase, connecting it to Betaflight and using pass through, or you could do it via the UART connection if you wanted to. Today, though, they have made a whole host of changes. And in fact, there is so many different ways to bind now, it's crazy. The great thing about it is they haven't taken away the ways you used to do it before. So you can still unplug and plug three times if you want to. You can still flash via UART. You can still flash via a binding phrase if you want to. But they've now added some improved binding methods that should make everyone's life a lot easier. Now, Captain Bry was the one who made the specific pull request for this. I know know he was working very hard in the background on this. He's done an incredible job, actually, of taking feedback from the community on this. He even asked me a few questions in the early days as well. And I have to say, I really do like what they've done here. Now, basics are as follows. Receivers can be bound, as I've said, the way they could be bound before. Nothing has changed around that. However, now a receiver with a button now have the bind option. So for instance, you can hold the receiver's button for 1.5 seconds and it will stick it into binding mode. There's also a new mode for volatile binding, which allows it to forget the binding on every reboot. So instead of having to bind it multiple different ways to different transmitters, what you can do is actually tell it to only bind once use it and then when you turn it off and turn it back on it'll be back in binding mode ready to use again this is going to be handy around race environments or places where people are swapping quads around regularly and what you're basically saying is power up it's in binding mode bind to a transmitter use it when you power it down it'll reset and go back to the start and then you need to bind it again the nice thing about this is it's really easy to do that because you can tell it to bind via the lua script on the transmitter so again if that's a feature you've wanted it is there now in the firmware the other two major big changes are the fact that the internal TX module now supports CRFS binding command from the handset. This is going to allow Edge TX to actually add a bind button within the model area of the radio rather than you have to actually open the ExpressLRS Lua script. This will actually be quite similar to the likes of FreeSky and others. So instead of having to connect your transmitter open up the Lua script and do things that way, in the model screen, you'll be able to just go in, hit bind, and then your transmitter goes into binding mode. 
They also say the receiver now also supports CRFS binding command from OTA, which is over the ear. So that means you can tell a receiver over the ear to go into binding mode as well. There are some requirements around that, but again, it just means that you can have a receiver buried in a frame and you can force it into a position if you want to. Now they do have a huge amount of info in here and I'm not going to read through everything, but there are some specific points I just want to talk about. As they say here, a receiver with no flash binding phrase or current binding info will boot into binding mode. So the great thing about this specifically is if you get a new receiver, you update the firmware either via the beta flight pass through or use something like this little adapter that I've got here from Radio Master. This is a UART adapter. When you flash it, as long as it's never been bound before, it'll reboot into binding mode. You can then just tell your transmitter to bind, it'll connect and it'll be ready to go. And we'll take a look at that specifically in a minute. Now, as I mentioned, you now have the button that you can use for binding. And another feature I just want to mention is this one down here, which is the user may hold the boot button for 15 seconds to erase all receiver configuration. And this will completely reset the receiver, including binding info. So if you have one that just isn't playing ball, you can now do it in the field via that button simply by pressing and holding it down. Okay, now just to demonstrate some of the binding features, here we have a receiver that has been updated to 4.5. It's currently bound to a different transmitter at the moment that isn't turned on. And what I just want to show you is how you can now bind this in beta flight. So now I've just powered it up and it's connected on the beta flight screen. If I hop over to the desktop, we're in beta flight. If we now go over to our receiver tab and at the bottom, you've got the bind receiver button down here. And if I just go back to the desktop over overhead and if I now click this watch the light on the receiver there you go you can now see that it has gone into binding mode so now I can simply click bind on my transmitter done ready to go no more messing around no more having to put in binding phrases if you don't want to you can simply just do that and it's ready to work now here is a receiver that i have just done the full update on and reset and now you can see it's reset into binding mode so all i need to do on this again is put it down into bind give it a second and then you can see it will connect what I want to demonstrate on this, though, is how easy it just is to reset that binding if you want to. So, for instance, if I just power this radio off a minute, and the reason I want to do that is this is connected and I want this to disconnect. There we go. It's disconnected, flash and amber, which means there's no connection. If I want to just quickly rebind this to a different transmitter, all we would need to do is press and hold the bind button down here for 1.5 seconds. So we'll just press and hold wait for the LED to go to double flash. There you go. It's gone to double flash again. Turn the transmitter back on, put it into binding mode. We'll be able then to just bind it straight to this transmitter. There we go. Hit bind. It's connected. It's as simple as that. The real big changes here is just how easy it is now to trigger binding mode. You can simply do it via the web UI. You can do it via beta flight, or you can simply reset it by the button. And this isn't everything. There are other options available here as well, if you want to. Now, the other cool options that are available are once the receiver is connected. So for instance, if I go down in the lure and go down to the bottom and you should see other devices under here is all of the options for this receiver. Now it's connected. So you can see there, it is showing and if I go into it, it'll download the protocol, the RX mode. So we've got diversity settings, TX power settings for the telemetry. And then we've got the new team race mode. We've then got the bind storage mode. So at the moment you can see it's persistent. This is where you can change that option from persistent to volatile, which means it'll forget the binding every time it repowers. We're going to keep that on persistent here today. And then You've got the option to force the receiver into binding mode again if you want to. So for instance, if you want to hand it over to someone else, you can simply say, hey, enter binding mode. And then you can see that the receiver's gone back into binding mode. It's disconnected from this radio. I could connect it to another one if I wanted to. 
Now this is all just made Express RS's binding experience so much better. I am going to be making a dedicated video on a start to finish bind for a brand new user. I'm going to just take you through what I think is the best steps. That'll probably be on the channel in the next week or so. Now with regards to the final thing I wanted to talk about is Gemini X, this new dual band version. It isn't something I can really demonstrate or show you here today. As I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in finding out more about Gemini, there is a link to my beta FPV review in the description where I actually go into depth of how Gemini works. Gemini X is just the same thing, but on two separate bands. And I'm looking forward to seeing what hardware comes out in the future because there isn't any hardware here today. I'm guessing we're going to see it from the major manufacturers. I don't know anything for sure, but watch this space. When it does come out, I'll definitely be talking about it. Now, before I wrap this video up, I have a plea to you, and that is please do support the ExpressRS Project via its Open Collective page. You can make a single donation or a recurring donation and thank the developers for the amazing work that they have done. Over the last few years, this project has grown incredibly, and this is as polished and finished product as I have seen from any company out there. It is the work that the Express RS dev team that you do see that you should thank them for, but also the work that you don't, because all of this amazing hardware that we've seen in the last few years would not have been possible without the tireless effort that they make in the background to work with vendors such as Radio Master and others to make the hardware work well. They have done an incredible job and please do go over to their Open Collective page. There is a donation option there. As I said, you can make a single donation or a recurring donation on a monthly basis and that way you are supporting the project to continue to do what it's done over the last few years. It is incredible how far Express LRS has come. It has taken over the RC Link side of things in drones and FPV and it is moving more into fixed wing as well every single day day and this system has just gone far beyond anything that any of us could have imagined and today is just a demonstration of the continued effort that the developers make, the work that they do to take the feedback from the community and deliver a product with features that we all want. Now as I've said the link is in the description below so please do make sure you check it out. Now today, I'm not going to ask you to support my channel because I want you to support them. So don't worry about my Patreon. If you're new here, check out the Express LRS dev team and support them. Anyway, that's it from me on this one. Stay safe, look after yourself. I'll speak to you soon.